This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 572 for September 23 of 2021, all about LIDAR and Ouster. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Hello, Gary. John, how are you? I'm doing well. How about you? Good boy. Fall has come in in a big way, in a big hurry. You know, on Monday, I was swimming in the pool. Today, we got the furnace on. Yeah, I was going to say. And uh, so, you know, here in Michigan, during the fall, lots of people hit deer with their cars. And I was reading some stats this morning that State Farm has. So in the United States, there's a 1 in 116 chance that a person will hit an animal with their car during the year. In Michigan, it's a 1 in 54 chance that you'll hit an animal with a car during the year. And Joe Manchin in West Virginia has a 1 in 37 chance. Virginia is the number one state in terms of uh, smashing into animals. Jeez. So anyway, so so we missed you last week on the show. I, I had two wonderful things for you to guess, okay? <laughs> One was in 1908, General Motors was incorporated by uh, Billy Durant. And then I was going to have, I know you're a big music fan. And this one was going to really try your your gray cells. That, oh, no. That, okay, maybe you'll get this. So this guy sang a song about a Jeep. And he died on September 16th, 1977. Who would that have been? Oh, man. A British, art, a, a British artist. Who sang about a Jeep. Mm-hmm. You got me get, again, Gary. I don't know. Mark Bolin of T-Rex. Oh, wow. I'm just a Jeepster for your love. Okay. A Jeepster, if you had said Jeepster. What? Well, but that's a that's a version <laughs> of a Jeep, which which segues into today. Okay, so I got one for today for you. So this oh, isn't oh, just okay. all last week. Okay, September 23rd, 1940, the first, and I use this generically, Jeep was delivered to the U.S. Army. What company was it? Oh, 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 gosh. I know this, too. It's it's somewhere in there, Gary. It's somewhere in there. What were they called? It was American something or other. Wow. You got the first word right. I know. I got the first right. Uh, the American Bantam Car Company. There you go. Of Butler, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And uh, they made 2,675 of the Bantam re- reconnaissance car. They lost the contract in 1941 and then proceeded to provide trailers for the army, which were towed behind the Jeeps that were made by who? By uh, Willys. That's right. And Ford. Ford made Jeeps as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, the army contracted out a lot. You know, there's a a lot of debate over where the name Jeep came from. Some people have said that uh, it stood for general purpose, GP. GP got pronounced Jeep. There was also a a cartoon character in the old Popeye cartoons, if you remember, named Jeep. And some people thought that it it came from that. I don't think it's ever been settled, but GP or general purpose vehicle sure sounds to me that's where the name came from. Mm -hmm. So with all that, let's move on to the right now. (laughs) Yeah, let's bring in Pete Bigelow from Automotive News, who's joining us today again. Hey, Pete. Good afternoon. Great great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Pete, good to see you. It's good to have you here. It's good to be here. Why don't you bring in our guest today? Introduce him to the the audience. Well, you bring Angus in for us. Come on, John. Okay. So we've got Angus Piccala. He's the CEO of a company called Ouster. Hello, Angus, and thanks for joining us on Autoline After Hours. Hi, everybody, and thanks for having me. I'm smiling because, 
you know, I have this stat from, from actually the Normandy invasion about Jeeps and vehicles. For every two men and women that were landed on Normandy, there was one vehicle landed at that same time. So you either got to drive or ride shotgun. And I think that kind of jump-started the whole American car car culture. So uh, I think it's a great stat. Anyway. Um, I never knew that stat. That's <laughs> a lot of Jeeps. <laughs> it's a lot of Jeeps. Yeah. So, so Angus, tell us what Ouster is. Explain to us what that company is all about. Yeah, so Ouster builds, we're, we're based in San Francisco. We are a digital LiDAR company. So we build LiDAR sensors, which LiDAR is a type of sensing technology, which is the main safety critical eyes of autonomous machines, whether they're cars or otherwise. And LiDAR stands for light detection and ranging. Um, and it's very similar in principle to radar, just radio detection ranging, or sonar, sa uh, 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 sonic uh, ra ranging. I actually don't know the, the, uh, uh, what that stands for. And then there's also uh, echolocation. So all of these involve bouncing electromagnet electromagnetic radiation or sound energy off an object and timing how long it takes to come back. And then you can build up a 3D view of the world as a result of that. So LiDAR is um, a critical sensing technology to give eyes to autonomous machines. And we build uh, digital LiDAR sensors. Angus, what makes your company different? I think Pete was the one who told me there's like, what, Pete, you told me 70 or 80 LiDAR startups are around the world right now. Everybody's jumping in the pool. So Angus, what sets you guys apart from the others? Yeah, well, th there are really three things. Um, the, the first is that we are a digital ladder company. And so lots of technologies evolve from analog first technologies, like the first mainframe computers were built from analog tubes and you know a complex set of electronics. Um, also true of camera technology and telecom infrastructure. And then at some point they transitioned to tightly integrated digital technology, whether it's the CPU um, in your computer or uh, the CPU in your cell phone or the digital camera chip that's in all the cameras that you use today. So that transition is a fundamental shift that happens across different technology sets. And LiDAR is ripe for this transition from complex analog and expensive technology to low cost um, silicon chip technology. And so Ouster is the first company that has introduced this digital LiDAR technology where we've packed complexity onto a single silicon chip um, and are getting you know, the benefits and affordability and performance. Um, you know, the, the other thing that's interesting about Ouster is just that we have diversified across markets. So we do have a significant automotive business um, that spans consumer ADAS, robo-trucking, robo-taxis, and, and shuttles and buses. But we also sell into adjacent verticals like um, industrial, smart infrastructure, and robotics. And, and that's relatively unique, actually. Um, most ladder companies have not diversified, and it's really the benefit of digital technology allows you to sell products across markets that are all built on one kind of technology architecture. Angus, is, is one of those markets or, or any of them more mature than the others at this point? And, and where does automotive uh, fit into that? Yeah, well, uh, automotive has, and, and consumer ADAS, and talking about OEM, uh, OEMs, they have, they're one of the most mature customer sets of anybody that we work with. Now, there are really mature customer sets like um, in, in mining, for instance, industrial heavy equipment, um, companies like John Deere and Caterpillar and Komatsu. Those are similarly kind of sophisticated and mature companies. But it's really um, so that's one way to answer it. There's lots of these really mature companies that have a, a strategy around adopting autonomy technology that in, in turn is about adopting LiDAR sensors into their platforms. Um, but then there are different timelines to actually get to production, you know, to series production. And automotive is still a maturing industry from that standpoint. Some of the major, the first major LIDAR deployments are have happened now, but it's on select luxury vehicles. And Ouster's goal is to drive the, the performance up and the affordability way up so that we can make this standard features and actually get like, you know, L3 autopilot systems out that have uh, LIDAR, LIDAR as an integral part. Um, whereas in industrial, there's other ways to get the technology out. For instance, a retrofit model. You know, we have customers that are actively operating mines with huge, um, uh, with huge haulers and crushers. And those vehicles have a 10, 15 year lifespan. And there's a, a model of retrofitting those to be more autonomous and, and more efficient. 
and so we can get the technology out faster for for an application like that. Angus, when you say low cost, what are you talking about? So some of your competitors out there are talking like a couple of hundred bucks for a unit. Uh, I know you can just we can talk about you know the capabilities of those units, but I this would be probably something that an automaker would put at each corner of the car. Where where do you stack up in price? Yeah, that's exactly right. So so the pricing in automotive is is more aggressive than any of our other verticals because consumers are feeling the pain, right? And you ultimately have to convince a consumer until the until it becomes a regulated safety technology. You really have to convince them that the price is worth the benefit, the future set. And um, so I think um, these cars need to have a rich feature set. You need about five ladder sensors, th four on the corners and one looking forward. Um, and the all-in package needs to be about $1,000 for the hardware hmm. for it to be pretty broadly accepted as a optional feature on like a mid, you know, a, a, um, a mid-scale car, like a $50,000, $50,000 car. And then... I think there's a further transition to low hundred dollar, like sub five hundred dollar options package for the hardware, where it can get into the, the lower end tier of vehicles, and ultimately it'll be regular. You know, it'll be a regulated safety component, which is the trajectory that I mean, it's a fantastic trajectory that all of these other safety technologies have fall, um, followed in automotive, radar being a recent one, cameras and uh, seat belts and ESD and or ESC and uh, and uh, uh, automated cruise control, all these things have, have followed a trajectory of cost reduction. Yeah. So when you say one at each corner and one looking forward, uh, you're talking level four capability and autonomy at that point? You know, I'm talking, so right now we're in a, a world where you can buy L2 systems, which means you have to pay attention, but the car will take a lot of the, the load off, the mental load off of driving. Um, and so you, you pay attention and the car drives itself. Uh, but but if you take your hands off the wheel for even 15 seconds, it'll beep at you until you put your hands back on. So you can't sleep, can't read a book, can't watch a movie. L3 is the transition from to full uh, hands-free, eyes-free driving, where the, the person still has to be alert in the vehicle, but they can read a book. You know, they can relax and do some paperwork on their way to work. They, um, and that, I think that's the compelling feature set that consumers will pay for. So it's L3, hands-free, eyes-free. And that's where you need a surround view system of LIDAR to be the redundancy that used to be on the human. The human used to be the redundant ele element in an L2 system. Now LIDAR is the redundant element in an L3 system. And that's um, and so that's where we're positioning our products. And, that, and that's why you need 360 degree coverage because it's the true redundant element all around the vehicle as, it, as the car drives you. Hey, and, then, me... and then L4, sorry, L4 is just one step beyond that. That's like fall asleep in your car and it'll drive you point to point, you know, door to door while you're asleep. That's a little further off. Angus, let me ask you, so you're, you're cross industry. So you have industrial market, smart infrastructure market, robotics market, and automotive market. So of those markets, it would seem to me that automotive is the most styling centric. So what do your units look like? I mean, do you do you think about that when you're designing them or is it purely function? Um, we, so, so I think we splashed on the scene some of our products today, but the goal is actually not to style the units to look one way or another, but actually to make them small enough and power efficient enough. Their size, weight and power swap is what it's called in, um, in the military, I guess make that small enough that you can hide them, completely hide them um, around the vehicle. And that's what's happened with digital cameras. And so that's that's one of the hallmarks of digital technology is by packing all of this complexity of a historically analog system onto one silicon chip, you can make the technology so small and so affordable and so power efficient that you can hide it behind the windscreen or behind a black cover on the front of the grill. Um, and you, you just, it fades into, in, into the background. You don't even know the technology is operating. And that's where we are with L2 systems today. You don't really know where the radar is or the cameras are unless you know where to look. So it's, it's not a KFC bucket on the top of the No, car. no, no. Yeah, yeah. The goal, exactly. No, not at all. <laughs> I guess I'm curious. It seems like not all that long ago, there was not a consensus that LiDAR was necessary for a, a level two driver assist system. But, but today, I think that there is a consensus on that. 
Uh, do you agree with that? And if so, how did we get here? You know, I am. Um, so there is a, so L2 systems exist today, like Tesla autopilot, the mobilized systems that you can buy uh, GM super cruise. They're all L2 systems. Um, and they operate with camera and radar and they're quite good. There are some places where they're not so good. And in those places, humans have to pay attention and take control. And you could add a LIDAR in those cases, probably one LIDAR, and get a slightly better in, uh, uh, um, performance. But the LIDAR would have to be pretty low cost because the benefits are pretty rare and it's hard for the consumer to actually measure what they would be. It's like, oh, on this particular curve, the car won't beep at you and ask for you to take control. Um, so it may be this occasional thing that it provides benefit for. L3 is really where I think the feature set is just justifies the extra expense of ladder sensors, where you can literally take your eyes off the road and relax in your car and not drive it. Um, and, and so we're positioning mostly for L3. Um, but we also, I mean, we're happy to sell L2 LiDAR systems. It's just uh, there are less opportunities, I think, because you're competing directly with mature camera radar systems. Angus, maybe I don't fully understand level three, but what you're si saying scares the hell out of me. And I think it would scare the hell out of any automaker from a liability standpoint. I can read a book or I can do paperwork, but I still have to be alert. What the safety experts will tell you is you got about two seconds to take your eyes off the road. So is a level three system going to give me wo more warning than two seconds? Because if not, uh, you, you got lawsuits written all over this. That's exactly right. So um, you have to have much more sophistication in the system to give you 30 seconds you know, or more of, of forewarning. Um, so these are true. An L3 system is much closer to, to an L4 kind of fully autonomous system than to an L2 system in terms of the technology stack and the capability. Um, it's just that there is, you are requiring the human to not fall asleep and to be able to take control in 30 seconds to a minute. Um, but it does scare the hell out of me unless, and, and, and that's why LIDAR is needed as this kind of redundant element. Um, if you're just relying on a single sensor modality like camera, um, you don't have redundancy in the system. And if that camera fails, then what are you going to rely on? There's literally, you know, there's nothing to fall back on. So that's where a separate sensing modality comes in um, to provide that redundancy because the human isn't. Um, so that's really important. Safety criticality comes through redundancy. And it's something that is true of automotive, but also of like aviation. And uh, I love this example of the, well, it's, it's an unfortunate example of the, the 737 MAX, where, you know, one of the issues was angle of attack sensor. There was no redundant sensor to check when the angle of attack sensor failed. There weren't two, there wasn't an independent measure of angle of attack. And that's a failure in system design on, on, of, of safety design on, and redundancy. And so LIDAR is the redundant sensing element necessary to make these systems safe um, in the first place. So, so to follow that thread, is it your belief that it is required that there be multiple different types of sensors or could this just be done with just all LIDAR sensors? It could be done with all LIDAR sensors. It could be done with all cameras, hypothetically. Um, and that's the talking point of Tesla. But would you wanna get in a car that did it only with cameras or with only LIDAR? And, and for me, the answer is no, because if either one, of, it's a single point of failure on either one of those sensing technologies. And if they fail, then what? there's no backup. And so I want redundancy and it's Ouster's job and you know, the LIDAR industry's job to get the technology affordable enough that it's just, it, you don't have to debate whether or not to do it, it's affordable enough and it just it just becomes a de facto standard. And that's, I mean, that's the success story of automotive safety technology for, for just decades and decades. And so I know that we're gonna get there with LiDAR as well. Yeah, so it's less a technical argument about like camera versus LiDAR. They're both, you know, they're both performant. It's just you need redundancy. Mm -hmm. To follow on that, Angus, uh, you know, obviously each sensor modality has its strengths and weaknesses what what are the strengths of lidar compared to compared to camera yeah and and that's a good point like redundancy doesn't just mean like the light the 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 camera sensor literally uh, fails completely it could be on a very dark road um that's that's got poor illumination a camera won't work nearly as well as a lidar sensor 
A lighter sensor works better at night than during the day. Um, a lighter sensor can see through fog and obscurance better than a camera. Um, radar can see even better through fog and obscurance than, than a camera or a, or, or a LIDAR. So there are benefits and drawbacks to every sensing modality. Um, and LIDAR, yeah, it's better in, in a number of obscurance. It's better at night by far, and it's far higher resolution than a radar sensor. So that's the, you know, radar provides 3D information, but it, it's like a very blurry view of the road. Um, and LIDAR provides this ultra crisp image, just like a camera. Maybe to follow that, Angus, how, you know, talk to me about range, resolution, reflectivity. Uh, what, where, where does the, what's the industry standard today? Uh, I mean, where, where does it need to go? Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know how lost in the weeds we want to go with the specs. I'm happy to talk about that. But I, at the end of the day, keep in mind, our goal is not to make the LIDAR front and center on the vehicle. It's actually for people to be unaware at why their car is driving so confidently and you know that that incident rates in this country go down and down and down um it's going to be because of lidar and other safety technologies and our job is to just make that a seamless thing that you know you don't even think about um what i would say on specs is that there are many different specs required because again we need to make a cocoon a 360 degree cocoon of coverage around the entire vehicle and so you need short range lidars wide fields of view in some places on the corners we need long range forward looking LIDAR, looking down the road. Um, they all have slightly different requirements and it's similar, um, it's shaping up very similar to like automotive radar where there are short, medium and long range automotive radar um, systems. And in modern cars, they may have three to five radar systems that are positioned around all corners of the vehicle and, and, and then in the front. So um, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a diversity of requirements. And, and, and this is also a place where digital technology is kind of the flexibility of a digital, digital architecture allows you to produce all of those sensors with, with that same digital technology. Just like you can build fisheye cameras and telephoto cameras all with the same digital technology. Angus, two questions, really. Uh, what, what's your business model here? Are you going to sell complete LiDAR units? Are you willing to sell the guts, of, as it were, to to other automotive suppliers? And can you talk to us about anything you got going with any of the car companies or their suppliers? Yeah, so we um, we have a bunch of different options open to us uh, on how we, what parts we sell or you know, full systems, subsystems, uh, discrete components. And it's, it's because we have invested in an automotive certified manufacturing line. Um, and so a lot of LiDAR companies have decided not to go this route. But because we have such a broad business that spans many different verticals, and because we want to have a lot of control over our supply chain, we've invested in a semi-automated manufacturing line with really good volume and, and automotive you know, IATF 16949 um, manufacturing certifications. Right? And so that allows us to sell direct full modules as a, you know, a tier one component supplier, not a tier one system supplier. I would still want to work with a tier one on the, you know, the larger system. Um, but it also allows us to provide a sub module. And so it really depends on the customer and um, ultimately OEMs are going to dictate really what they want here. I'd love to push them and uh, into a certain model, but you know, they have the preferred way of working and, and we're open and flexible to work in the way that they need. Angus, we, you know, we're talking a lot about cars here and, and um, I first became aware of you guys um, when the company plus which is making systems uh, automated systems for amazon um you guys are going to be providing the lidar for that came came up and so i'm wondering to what extent is lidar technology and um development as well as cost reduction going to come from the commercial world versus from the consumer world yeah well, one of the reasons why digital technologies win is because the consumer world is driving CMOS silicon semiconductor technology with the huge volumes that are driven in smartphones and personal computers. And, um, and so the success of digital silicon in commercial markets is really driven by the volumes and the R&D investment to make consumer products better. Um, and, and so we are leveraging that. That's one of the reasons we have confidence in our roadmap getting better and better and better is because 
it's just leveraging the same technology that the you know the broader smartphone market is using. So, uh, so th the core answer is that consumer is driving everything uh, once you jump to digital. Um, but, but there is this backdrop of we have to drive particular feature sets in our lidar sensors that are enabled by technology, but that you know that we implement into our chips, and so things like. Um, uh, enhanced ruggedization or all-weather performance uh, might be driven more by a dockyard application or a mining customer set that's even dustier and even colder and even snowier than anything you see in Detroit. And I know that's hard to believe, but it's the truth. There are <laughs> snowier and colder places than Detroit. And um, and so that that's one of the things that's been interesting about our business is that we have even more extreme examples of the use cases than uh, outside of automotive mining is a great example than in automotive and we're building to that and allowing that to kind of dictate the, the the product roadmap so the consumer provides the volume but the capabilities may come from the commercial world that's right yeah angus i, I heard you say not too long ago that you you intend or aspire to put a lidar on every moving thing on earth uh how how big does this get how, how do you uh, multiple markets evolve by say 2030. Yeah, and you know, I stand by that statement. And the, the reason I like LiDAR is because it, it directly is impacting quality of life and safety in the workplace, on the commute. And one of the reasons we're playing across industries, we talk about the 40, 35, 40,000 people that die every year in accidents on roadways, but the number of workplace injuries related to heavy equipment and in industrial settings is is much beyond that. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, it's not just about automating everything. It's actually about providing safety augmentation to everything. Uh, most of the platforms we work with aren't getting fully automated. They're getting a driver's aid, like an L2 or L3 system, but for a big mining truck or a big agricultural machine. And, um, and I really like that LiDAR is hitting at that that core kind of quality of life um, concern across industries. And so, um, yeah, putting LiDAR on every moving object on earth is a way to, to drive down all of all of those, th th those accidents worldwide. Real good. That may be the perfect note to, to wrap up this segment on. Angus, thanks for coming on the show. Very interesting to see what you're doing. Uh, the future looks bright for LiDAR, I think. I know Tesla doesn't want to go that way, but it seems like everybody else does. So you should have a pretty good business opportunity as this decade rolls out. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, everybody. Okay. Um, I, I, I got to ask you, can you de can you detect deer? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Deer, uh, all animals, they light up um, Just want to make sure. as bright as day in the dark with a LiDAR sensor. <laughs> 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 good point, Gary. Yeah, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to thanks, be Angus. coming back uh, to talk more about the automotive industry. But again, Angus, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, everybody. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. Okay, we're back. And uh, Pete, what do you make of all this? You know, uh, what I find interesting about LiDAR vis-a-vis -vis Tesla is that it seems to me like all the car companies are in a mad rush to collect as much data as they possibly can. And LiDAR is, uh, gives you another sensor suite that gives you even more data. Yeah, I think you're right, John. Data and redundancy. I think Angus hit that point well. And I, I think it's very true that when you know that uh, you know you're trying to get to however many nines in, in safety, uh, you know how can you not use a, a sensor that that clearly you know helps get you there? So I, I do think for for both driver assist uh, and and fully self driving cars, it, it's clearly uh, it, 
you know, in some cases, maybe an added benefit, but clearly improves safety and, and does not diminish it. Yeah. I, I think perhaps one of the issues, though, is is that you know this this talk about redundancy, and people are going to say, you know what, we we've already spent a ton here. All the numbers look pretty good. Um, do we really need to put the cherry on top? Well, Gary, I would say yes, because as we've seen with some of the Tesla autopilot crashes, uh, and, and maybe to look at it from a, a full self driving test scenario, the the Tempe crash, uh, you know, one accident when it comes to machines versus you know humans one accident is, is a huge public relations and safety problem so so i think putting that cherry on top as you call it is is critical for the success of the industry and you know the, the counter argument would be you know do you want to risk flushing all the investment you've uh, had so far uh, you know away uh, based on one accident that maybe lidar could prevent yeah you know one of the things that you have to do in court if you're litigated on this issue is prove, hey, look, we did everything possible. You don't want the people suing you to say, hey, did you consider LIDAR? Yeah, we did, but we didn't put it on for cost reasons. And so in these early days, and look, we're not even to autonomy yet, right? We're, we're even pre-early days. Uh, I, I think once the industry gets a lot of experience under its belt, maybe then they can talk about decontenting some of the sensor suite in an autonomous system. But early on, you better have all the bells and whistles. So, so Pete, let me ask you. Um, so speaking of autopilot and speaking of Tesla and speaking of um, cases, as it were, or potential cases. So NHTSA is investigating 12 accidents that involve autopilot, um, you know, scrutinizing whether the Tesla approach, which John, as you mentioned earlier, is is purely predicated on using cameras. Although there are ultrasonic sensors in the in the Tesla models for for parking purposes, but um, do you see the possibility that what might come out of this would be a requirement that if you are, are going to have systems that are quote unquote self driving, it will be required that you have a suite of sensors? I. I don't personally see that happening, Gary. I don't think that NHTSA is going to mandate a particular technology. Uh, they've been very reluctant to do that, you know, with any number of innovations in the past. Uh, but I do foresee them saying, here's, you know, here's a benchmark you have to hit uh, in terms of performance and reliability, however you want to get there. Uh, and that's what I see happening more so than, than NHTSA saying, you must use LiDAR. So, so, so keeping you on the spot, so a um, bunch of uh, MIT people did a paper titled A Model for Naturalistic Glance Behavior Around Tesla Autopilot Disengagements, which I know you are an expert on, Pete. So, so tell us what they found. Well, I, I'm no MIT expert, but uh, I can relay their findings. And they, they essentially found that when motorists are using Tesla Autopilot in particular, they are glancing away from the road uh, for for non-driving reasons, they call it, uh, more so than they were during manual driving. Uh, so they are, they're looking away from the road uh, for longer than that two second threshold that we mentioned earlier in the show, uh, which is obviously a critical one. And uh, MIT is not necessarily saying that's good or bad from a safety perspective, but what they are saying is, hey, we've had this two second threshold that's been um, not a mandate, but a uh, federal policy for a long time they're asking the question, is this a good idea that we're redefining what, what driving is and, and you know, what that, that uh, attention level needed to operate a car while using a driver assist uh, system is? So it's an interesting question. And I think that it, it does help to inform the uh, kind of ongoing debate about what, what constitutes safe behavior when you're a human using a, uh, a driver assist system, be it autopilot or something else. You know, all the car companies found that out with their auto autonomous testing. And this goes back for several years. They put an autonomous car on the test track at their proving grounds. They put engineers in and five minutes later, the engineers are on, you know, looking at their phones, doing their email and stuff like that. It's, you know, the, the, uh, the acceptance of, or the confidence that these people put in these systems comes very, very quickly. That, that's exactly it, John. And it's, uh, it's a story that, you know, I'm sure you both have heard John Kraftchick tell uh, 
you know, about the guy who was driving his Porsche and he, he fell asleep behind the wheel in the early days of, of Google testing. And, and their response to that was, this is unsafe. We can't do a driver assistant system. Uh, we're going to go all the way or none of the way when it comes to autonomy. Uh, so clearly there's two very different roads here. And, and that it, it's interesting that no one else is really, or let's just say the traditional automakers making driver assist systems have not heeded that warning uh, to the extent that they've considered the, you know, the inherent question, like, is this a good idea? What they do is they, they add a driver monitoring system or, uh, you know, find other ways to try and keep a driver paying attention. But, but I think uh, that's the big reckoning that's coming, I think is, uh, you know, maybe from one of these NHTSA investigations is, is this inherently enhancing safety to, to put in a level two driver assistance system when, there's a system controlling the driving, but the human is still ultimately responsible. You know, one of the things, um, so I, I was reading a story about sort of, sort of a colleague of yours, Mark Vaughn at Auto Week. So I guess same family anyway, with automotive news. Um, and and he and his his thing was about, you know, um, the move to electric vehicles and, and, you know, don't worry enthusiasts, it'll be fine. And there were some stats in there that, that really surprised me. He talks about the Rimac Nevera, which makes... 1,914 horsepower and 1,741 foot-pounds of torque, zero to 60 in 1.85 seconds, okay? Um, then he has the Porsche Taycan, which goes up to 750 horsepower, and the Turbo S, which can go from zero to 60 in 2.6 seconds. And let's not leave out the Tesla Model S Plaid, which is 1,020 horsepower in a 0 60 time of 1.99 seconds. Okay, here's my question to you guys. Does driver's ed make anybody capable of driving vehicles of this nature? I, I, it's a simple answer, Gary. Hell no. <laughs> Let's say, Gary, you reading those statistics off, maybe uh, kind of wish for the the apparently tame old days of the Hellcat, which was like, you know, 707 horsepower. And I forget the the uh, immediate pound feet of torque. But, uh, you know, I agree with John. The short answer is is no, be it be it that power or or how to use a driver assist system, for another example. Uh, no, these are all things that uh, that we inherently don't are, are more complicated these days. So. I think there's more training needed. But, you know, it, it's it's not the exotic cars like you're quoting there, Gary, that concern me. It's uh, middle market cars that concern me. Because presumably somebody who's stepping into uh, a Tesla S Plaid or, you know, any of the other cars that you talked about here with a anything over a thousand horsepower, presumably it's mostly enthusiasts or it's people who recognize they're getting into a car that's got mind blowing uh, uh, performance, but mid-level electric cars also have pretty terrific acceleration, which I happen to love. But I think for certain brands, you're going to catch your, your owner base unawares that these cars can just really take off. And so somebody pulling out of the parking lot at the, the shopping center is is going to see a car coming up uh, on them and they're going to hit the gas and that thing is going to take off like they never experienced and it's going to cause an accident. That Those are the kinds of, uh, or that's the level of performance with electric cars that I'm more concerned about is for people who are just, you know, uh, tepid drivers, maybe not, not very good and have this amazing acceleration they've never gone through before. Well, John, exactly to that point, uh, it was what just this summer where we had the uh, Tesla crash in Houston that killed two people, uh, and it, it happened like you know you see the video of these guys pulling out of their their driveway, and two blocks later they're they're dead and wrapped around a tree. So I, you know, I can imagine the acceleration and forces at play, you know, with power that you're not necessarily used to. Yeah, and John, I think that a guy who buys a two point four million dollar Rimac probably is not an automotive enthusiast. He's just sort of a guy who has a lot of money to burn and he probably is no better a driver than any of us. And we're perhaps even better drivers than that person is because we spend so much time driving cars. That's right. But, you know, I mean, it, it, so this, this race is an interesting point though. I mean, and, and so I've read research whereby um, people who become familiar with using driver assistance systems um, become 
dependent on them rather quickly. You have vehicles that, you know, people can get in. And then as you say, John, you know, you just get on the, get on the accelerator and boom, you're gone. So if, if somebody is used to having the car drive for them, then they get into a car that has this kind of performance. I mean, we're not getting more safety here. We're getting less safety. Don't you think that driver's education has to evolve? I, I could almost see, and maybe it doesn't quite get to this level, but you know, if, if you're going to pilot different types of airplanes, you, uh, you need a type rating for each specific model that you're going to fly, be it a 737 or, or Airbus 320, et cetera. So it, it wouldn't strike me as crazy. I know that there'd be a lot of pushback against this, but you know, if you're going to use uh, a, a vehicle that, that has certain performance characteristics or a certain driver assist system, uh, it would not strike me as crazy to say that there's a certain amount of training required on that system. Yeah, well, that's a pipe dream, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen, not in the United States. I mean, driver's ed has been a joke since the beginning. When I took driver's ed, I never drove at night. I never drove on the highway. I never drove in rush hour traffic, never in the snow or ice or anything like that. And then to pass the test, it's what I call multiple guess. You know, it was, uh, you know, uh, questions with, you know, four answers and you had to guess at the right one. It's easy to get a driver's license. Why? Because if you don't have a driver's license in this country, most of the the places we live do not have good public transportation. So people need this. They rely on it. They have to have it. Uh, I sure would love to see driver's ed be far more comprehensive than it is. But I and you guys, too, have probably been complaining about this forever. Nothing's changed. I don't see anything that's going to change it. I don't either. And, you know, it's interesting, John, like we've been talking about the uh, you know re re potential requirements or you know skills needed to drive cars at the high end of the spectrum. But to your point, uh, driver's ed here is, is a farce. And, you know, back to my regulatory thoughts, boy, if we could get some of the worst drivers off the road, even though that they're in some, some, you know, basic models right now, like that's something else that would clearly improve safety. If you could, if you could take the bottom 5% off the road, uh, you know, there's no doubt that that roads would be safer. But again, I know that I am, uh, I, I'm dreaming of something that, that is light years away. I don't know why, but you're just talking about that reminded me of the old George Carlin line. Have you ever noticed that anyone driving slower than you is a moron and <laughs> anyone going faster is a maniac? <laughs> that, uh, that is a great line that, and I, I remember that too. Uh, it's going back a ways, but uh, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if you guys have talked to uh, the Israeli company Nexar, uh, but they're making, uh, you know, essentially a dash cam, but, the algorithms detect the, the license plates, I believe, of the cars in the surrounding area and can also, uh, you know, evaluate the competence of, of people driving. So you kind of get assigned a, a social score or a, you know, a driving score that, you know, who knows, one day maybe that follows you around or, or carries benefits or penalties. Hmm. You know, you, you mentioned off-road and it began, I began thinking about like the proliferation now of vehicles like Bronco and, and, you know, Jeep rolling out with no more models and people who are incapable of safely driving off-road. I mean, and, and it's going to be themselves at danger more than other people. And it's just like, okay, is, is this another thing? that the auto companies are providing a means by which, you know, people are really going to screw things up badly. That's a good question, Gary. And I think, you know, it, it's hard, it's hard to answer, but prob probably yes. But uh, what you're asking makes me think of something that uh, Jennifer Hamandy, the new chief of the national transportation safety board said just within the last week or two, uh, you know, the way she said, it's time that we stop blaming drivers uh, entirely for for crashes or irresponsibility and, and she seemed to indicate that we should we should question why car companies are making cars that that go 120 miles an hour or uh you know have certain other performance capabilities well, that, let me let me guess her background is in plaintiff attorneys right <laughs> i mean that's their argument oh no no it's not the people who who, who runs the red lights 
I mean, that, that, that's the biggest source of, of traffic fatalities is people running red lights. I don't know if that's the biggest source, John. I think it's people who are speeding, which makes your point somewhat valid. It's why, you know, maybe people aren't speeding at 130 miles an hour, but for a car that goes on public roads where that's not, uh, you know, not a, a something that you can do under a speed limit anywhere, except for the places where there is no speed limit. Um, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting question. Why, why are we making cars this way? Well, look, this has been argued about since the beginning. Why are we making cars so powerful in that? I got to tell you, when you're getting on an expressway and that Mack truck is barreling down on you, you want to be able to hit the pedal and go. Or pulling out of, uh, as I was talking about before, you pull out of a shopping mall or something, traffic's bearing down. You got to get up and go. You need that kind of power. Now, you don't need you know, to take it to the top speed of the vehicle, but, you know, you want to get up and go when you need the power. You got to have it. Maybe it should be like in those electric cars where you have the the race cars, I mean, where you have the boost button where you get that period of like, boom, and you get to go and then it then it stops like a super capacitor. You've got a limited amount. But listen, I think if we took every licensed driver and put them through a driving school, and I don't mean to try to come out with the fastest laps that you can do. But basic things, threshold braking, maneuverability, and things like that, you, you would el eliminate so much of this driver error. But the big thing is people not paying attention, running red lights, running stop signs. Those are the, the biggest causes of traffic fatalities. You know, when, you, when you're going down the freeway and speeding, guess what? And everybody's going pretty much in the same direction. Uh, it's not good to have an accident, but everyone's going in the same direction. It's when cars collect or, or uh, crash head on or T-bone each other. And it's overwhelmingly at intersections where that happens. Well, I think the, the added you know, layer I would put on top of that, John, is the, the distraction right now. I, it does not give me confidence to be going in the same direction as someone who's staring at their phone. And of course, <laughs> whether we're at intersections or on the highway or anywhere, like any, we'll go out you know, in five minutes, I could collect 30 examples of people who are are, are scaring me with their, you know, total devotion to their handheld device behind the wheel right now. Oh yeah. It happened to be yesterday. There was one of those morons merging onto the freeway at 35 miles an hour and looking at his phone. It's not, not exactly an opportune time to take a glance, uh, but you know, it, it's really powerful to see it at intersections or when you're getting on the road uh, on the highway to, to see that people really don't put it down and, I think we're, we've yet to really measure the the impact of that distraction uh, in terms of of hard safety numbers or you know how many crashes is that causing? We we all intuitively know it's a lot, but uh, it's getting harder for law enforcement to to really understand that. And in some cases, even on their traffic crash report forms, there's no there's no box to check whether or not uh, they're using a handheld device, or it's hard and expensive for them to investigate whether that that was the the cause of a crash. All right, so let's let's move to another topic. Um, so so there was uh, some executive movement news this week. Mike Manley leaving Stellantis and going uh, going to sell cars. What do you guys make of this this move uh, from from Stellantis to AutoNation? Go ahead, Pete. You know, I I guess I think that it was probably clear he was not going to uh, rise to the top spot at Stellantis. I think there was a uh, you know, a strategy meeting where there was a good dozen or so Stellantis executives who uh, were rolled out to discuss one topic or another in, in recent weeks. And, and Mike was not among them. And I don't know if that's because he already had one foot out the door or, or because that was another kind of key sign on the wall that, that he was where he was going to be and, and go no further and, uh, and that he wanted to look elsewhere. So I, I other than that, I'm not. I'm not really sure. Like, why AutoNation? Maybe a chance to bring in a proven executive who who can bring stability to an organization that they needed it. But uh, but I, I think that it, my take would be that it was clear he wasn't going any higher and he wanted to look elsewhere. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, uh, I'm surprised he stayed this long. To be honest, at Stellantis, when the, when the merger happened, it, it's clear Carlos Tavares is running the show. No question about it. And most. People who reach the level of CEO don't like taking a demotion. So for Mike Manley to be CEO of Fiat Chrysler, you know, and running the whole show, 
to now being maybe like what executive vice president or senior vice president of the Americas that doesn't work with that kind of personality. And, and, and I'm not just saying Mike Manley, I'm saying that's the, the personality of the people who hit that level. But, you know, Mike is uh, interesting. Uh, I believe his family had a dealership. Uh, I mean, he grew up in a dealership, so to speak. I, I believe in early, early in his career, he even sold cars. So I, I think he's got an affinity for the sales side and the, and the dealer side of uh, the business. So maybe it makes a lot of sense for AutoNation to pick him up. And besides, they've had a real uh, problem trying to find a successor to Mike Jackson. You know, it, it just hasn't worked out that well. So you, you probably needed uh, or probably the board of AutoNation wanted somebody of Mike Manley's stature to finally come in and replace Mike Jackson. You know, I thought it was interesting. Um, you know, you mentioned Carlos Tavares, who's who's running Stellantis now. And and as as you know, um, he had been at Nissan. He said that he wanted to become the CEO. Um, Carlos Ghosn didn't like that. Tavares leaves. Right. And and so. This the CEO thing, and so in the quote, a quote of Tavares's message to Manley, departure from Stellantis, said, "Quote: While I'm personally sorry to no longer have Mike as a colleague, I'm equally delighted for his new CEO role." So it's almost as if here, here's a guy who's saying, "You know what? I know that he wanted to be a CEO. He, in as Pete, as you said, he wasn't going to be a CEO at Stellantis." So. He now has a CEO position at um, a company that can probably do Stellantis some good in terms of uh, moving some of its metal in this country. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's spot on, Gary. I, I feel like you know, especially with the industry um, as as red hot as it's been over the last you know twelve fifteen months, that that what a, what a good place to go. Like you said, maybe, maybe that's a smooth connection and it brings. Auto Nation, the stability that I, I think that they they really need right now. Like to, to John's point, like the board's making a big hire or a big splash, and they, they kind of have to get this one right. Mm -hmm. So, so John, you went to um, Motor Bella this week, or maybe that should be called Motor Bagnato, which apparently is Motor Damp. Um, tell us about what you uh, you experienced there. Yeah. So, for those who don't know. The Detroit Auto Show has been in downtown Detroit in January forever, as, as far back as I can ever remember. And all auto shows in the world are in trouble right now. So they decided to do something different, something outdoors, not in January. They moved it to September. Um, and, you know, when you move it outdoors, you're rolling the dice. You, you could have bad weather. And uh, so the first day on Tuesday wasn't bad. <laughs> Uh, until the very end of the day, and boy, the skies opened up, and uh, I, I could not believe how water was dropping out of the sky. Uh, and the last two days of things have been canceled. Looks like tomorrow the weather is going to improve, and and hopefully that'll work out for them over the weekend for the public days. I think the public's actually going to like this show. There's a lot to look at. There's a lot to see. Um, it's uh, very engaging. I mean, there, there's off-road tracks where you can get in a Ram TRX and get the thing airborne and uh, Jeeps that can climb up and down and around things and bro the Ford Bronco, you can take a ride in the Mustang Mach-E. I think the public's going to like that sort of stuff. Uh, but from the media standpoint, you know, we go to learn and see new concept cars, new models. It was kind of slim pickings. Now, the one thing I really did like is they, they have this adjunct to it that they call automobility for uh, startups to show their things. And I ran across this company called Lighten, L-Y-T-E-N, that claims it's got a battery breakthrough. And I, we, we got to get them on the show, Gary, because this is really, really interesting. If they could deliver what they're talking about, this is absolutely a game changer. They, they figured out a way how to crumple up graphene. And graphene, as you guys know, it's this semi-miraculous kind of material that was only discovered like about 20 years ago or so. And we're only just now recently starting to see it put into some sort of applications. But long story short is they figured out a way to crumple up graphene and make lithium sulfur batteries, which heretofore just would fall apart after 100 cycles and be dead. But by using this graphene, they're able to get like over a thousand cycles in it. So 
The batteries are lighter. They're a whole lot cheaper. They've got three times the energy density. Um, and the, the most interesting thing is you can make these batteries with material sourced right out of the U.S. There's no nickel. There's no manganese. There's no cobalt. I mean, the other interesting thing from a geopolitical standpoint, it would instantly obsolete the material supply chain that China has essentially locked up. So I know they got to deliver, but the game they're talking is pretty good. And I, I met their technologists and, and stuff like that. And uh, I came away impressed. You know, it's interesting, John, like this is not uh, a thought against Lightning in particular, but Boy, how many companies have we heard about who have like the key battery breakthrough? Yep. So, yep, uh, totally agree, Pete. I, I've so, often said, God, I wish I just had a dollar for every time I heard somebody announce a battery breakthrough. <laughs> uh, you know, it is intriguing. And to your point about the geopolitical atmosphere, that that one in particular uh, is really interesting because as, as you both know, um, you know, China has a huge head start uh, in, in all aspects, I think of they've locked it up. They, they yeah. control 80% of the, the materials and the processing, more importantly, the processing of those materials. Yeah. So I, I think that um, Lighten will get a, a longer look than any. So I, I hope that they, I hope that they can deliver. Yeah. But, you know, here, here's the thing I wonder about and, and this, 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 uh, I'll use an analogy and John, you'll, you'll appreciate this one perhaps. So, so let's say that I, I'm, I'm running a, an engine plant and I've got this engine line and I've, I've capacitized it to make cast iron blocks on nodular gray iron. Okay. Then somebody says, well, you know what? You really ought to use aluminum. Okay. So I've got this line. Now I've got to, I've got to do something to change it because you just can't switch from one to the other. So I need new spindles and I need new tooling. I need new fixturing. I may need new, new material handling. You know, it's, it's, it's a big, big deal to, to make the switch, right? So you've got the plant going down, uh, going up in Lordstown, Ohio right now, right? That, that the Altium sells, you've got Ford working with SK innovation on creating batteries. You've got Tesla's investment in, in Nevada and in places all over the place, right? So they're all locked into certain chemistries at this point in time. I'm not so sure that it's so simple to basically say, you know what, this lithium ion stuff ain't going to make it. So we're going to have to change to lithium sulfur. So we'll just pour in new ingredients at the front of the line. I, I, I have a feeling that it'd be very, very expensive to make this switch. And, and therefore there's going to be a certain amount of reticence when it, when it comes to new, new technologies. No, that's a great point, Gary. But I would point out we did go to aluminum blocks, and uh, and it was almost a wholesale conversion. Uh, the the thing that's attractive about what Lighten is doing is it doesn't matter what battery format you want, cylindrical, prismatic, um, pouch doesn't matter. You can use their technology in any format. So the manufacturing uh, equipment that you already have to make the batteries, you can use. Uh, to your point, if you've uh, invested in processing nickel, manganese, uh, cobalt, uh, that's a threat. But to my knowledge, none of the automakers are doing any of that stuff anyway. Uh, they're, they're not. In, in fact, they're, they're very concerned about the source of raw materials. There's a mad scramble on in, in Europe and the U.S. to to not be so reliant on China. And we're still early days, even though you're right, there's uh, GM's committed to this big battery plant. Ford's uh, uh, talking about doing the same, not talking, they're going to do the same with SK, but we're still very early. As you guys know, if, if we're going to get to even the Biden administration's goal of 50% EVs by the end of this decade, I, I, I can't quote the exact number, but we need a whole lot more gigafactories. So there's still more to come. And if this technology proves uh, promising, uh, I, I don't think it's going to be that much of an impediment. And I think, you know, along the similar lines, like from a cost perspective, uh, you know, we keep hearing that the price of batteries is going to fall. Well, well, not if, if the raw materials are scarce and it's harder and harder to get them from China. So, so that's where maybe there's an opening for a company like Lighten to come in and say, Hey, you know, this is expensive to switch uh, your factories over to your point, Gary, but maybe not as expensive as as chasing the uh, 
uh, you know, remaining materials from elsewhere. Yeah, when the category of materials is called rare earths, you know, you got this sense that, you know, maybe they're not so available. Well, they are, though. They're, 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 they're maybe misnamed in that regard. And it turns out, guess what? The largest rare earth open pit mine in the world is in California. And 100% of their, pro of their product goes to China for processing and then gets shipped back here or, or, or wherever in the world. Hmm. And, and that's what everybody's uh, afraid of. And, and the lesson was what happened to uh, Japan's supply of rare earths coming from China uh, in 2010. You know, they started the squabble over some islands in the South China Sea and China cut off uh, Japan. And uh, Japan went on an all out effort to uh, reduce its dependency on China. Here we are a decade later. They still have to source 50 percent of their rare earths from China. So it, it's not like you can spin on a dime and, and change supply chains. When it comes to mining, I mean, it, it takes a couple of decades to, to get this stuff up and running. So, so I want to wrap this by going back to the, to the start of the show. And, and um, John, you said that Pete had indicated that there are like 70 to 80 LIDAR companies out there. I, I seem to remember you saying that, Pete. All right, just I think whatever. it was on I mean, this show, in fact. But anyway, it, sorry. Uh, I mean, I, I've, 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 I've out there. So yes, I, I think that number is uh, is accurate. So I mean, I got it before the show started. I got another email just today about a new lidar startup that you know is the best ever. So they say, right? Okay. So so here's my question, Pete. Do you see there being a consolidation of these companies or do you think that their technologies are so different that we're just going to, they're just going to be winners and losers. And some of these companies are just going to go away. I think that's more so the latter Gary. I think that's, you know, I, I don't, I don't know how many, but uh, I've heard Angus say before, we didn't get to ask him about this. I've heard him say that there's going to be five companies left uh, when all is said and done. And, and, you know, I don't know if that final number is five or 20, but I think it's probably somewhere in there and not, not 60 to 80. And I think that the ones who don't, uh, don't get contracts or the ones who really can't manufacture at scale are the ones that, you know, for, it's great if you have the game changing technology, but if, if you can't make, you know, 2 million of them in, uh, you know, they meet all automotive grade requirements, then it's not very feasible. So I think that's where um, the LIDAR segment is going to be won or lost. And, you know, I'm sure by, if we're sitting here talking in 2025, uh, I'm sure that a good number of those companies are going to, uh, you know, wilt away uh, naturally because they're not going to not going to be getting into the driver assist business that's going to produce the volume that gets gets full full autonomy at some point. Yep, totally agree. I mean, uh, that's the history of the auto industry. Any technology gets whittled down to a handful of global suppliers who are caught in a cost race to the bottom. So I wonder if the companies are going to be absorbed by the likes of Bosch or Continental or Denso or, or you know, Aptiv or, or, or some of these other companies that are just going to basically say, okay, you know, this, this is our turf. This is our field. This is where we work. This is where we've made our bones. We'll do this. You know, you startups or you, you companies in Silicon Valley, eh, you know, I'm glad you developed this stuff, but leave it, leave it to the big boys. Well, Gary, just listen, you know, the, all the companies that you just mentioned, traditional tier one suppliers are all involved in LIDAR, all believe they have the best system too. There's no need for them to go out and buy these Silicon Valley startups, unless there might be one here or there or something like that. What they're going to let them do is collapse and go poach the best people that they need. Do you yeah, see that, Pete? I, I would tend to agree with that. Uh, you know, I, I don't see the need for the, the tier ones to buy these companies because they're already working with them. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what the advantage is as the race to the bottom continues to spend a lot of money to, to buy one. Um, who I do see bu buying them are, are some of the Silicon Valley companies. Like you look at Aurora and they have uh, purchased two LIDAR companies and, and, you know, and brought it all that development in house. So 
for someone who's going level four or bust and is not a uh, traditional automaker or tier one supplier, like that's where maybe the LiDAR companies have, have a lot of potential to be purchased. All right. So Aurora, a company that is developing self-driving systems would buy sensor companies in order to make its offering more complete to an automaker or a truck manufacturer? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. Like they've got a, a sensor that they believe is a game changer in some way. And they bought, uh, it was Aurora who bought um, Blackstone? Black, Blackmore, Blackmore, the, the lighter company from Montana, because they, they felt like their uh, FMCW technology uh, was really perfect for highway applications. And now I think that they're claiming they can see 400 meters or more. I, th I think that's the latest. If I remember that correctly, if I've got it wrong, don't, uh, you know, don't just don't write John, me. just write, you know, just, just asterisk. We need to check yeah. that. And then they, then they bought ours technology earlier this year to, to use some of their manufacturing processes and that, and you know, that, that was the other game changer that Aurora saw. So I could see a, you know, maybe someone like Zooks or um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of, you know, another company, some of the trucking companies, perhaps, if they feel like uh, there's a game changer in in terms of LiDAR, I could see more more acquisitions on, on that front, more more so than traditional automotive. So, so do you see a company like an Aurora or an Argo AI or fill in the blank, basically selling like a black box to a vehicle manufacturer and saying, here's all you need. It'll be level three, level four, what have you. Um, eventually, I mean, I guess it depends on the application. Are you talking about for a, a taxi uh, service or for a personally owned vehicle? Like, I think, I think the systems are pretty different based on, based on which one of those you're talking about. So, so yes and no is my cop out answer. <laughs> well put <laughs> well that's probably a good place to wrap up pete thanks for coming back on always a pleasure to have you here and you know be able to tap into all your knowledge well thank you for uh, both having me it's been great to uh catch up and i enjoyed the conversation today well, thanks good. pete appreciate it well good gary let's do it again next week all right let's do that okay take care everyone auto line after hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.